Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Power of Big Data, the need for responsibility and accountability. Both the chat and the Q&A features will be available throughout this session, so please ask questions, make comments, and stay engaged. Thank you for joining us today for the, for, and for attending this session. Now I'll turn it over to the moderator to introduce today's panelists. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to moderate this session. I think um, everyone's in for a real treat. Um, we have three distinguished speakers. Um, they're going to address the balance that we need to achieve between the power of big data with responsibility and accountability um, for researchers, for clinicians, and for others involved in, in healthcare. Um, our first speaker is Jody Daniel. She's a partner with Kroll and Mooring, um, and she will provide an overview of privacy protections for patients as they relate to the use of big data. Our second speaker is Glenda Roberts. Um, Ms. Roberts is the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement for the University of Washington's Kidney Research Institute and the Center for Dialysis Innovation. And she will address the patient perspective on potential misuse of data, highlighting the work of a new task force focused on eliminating race-based algorithms in nephrology as, as a model. And our third and final speaker is Harlan Krumholz, who's a, the Director of the Yale New Haven Hospital uh, Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, or CORE. And Dr. Krumholz will address the Hugo Project's current efforts, and empower, current efforts to engage and empower patients with their own data. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I'll introduce our first speaker. And as she's getting set up, um, we will be taking questions at the end. So we'll have three straight presentations and then um, your questions. And we will, um, Deidre will open up the chat so people can start to post questions. And we're looking forward to um, a very interactive session at the end. So um, Ms. Daniel, uh, you're up first. Okay, let's see if I can do this. I believe in you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, hold on. Uh, hold on. Are you seeing the right? Are you yes. seeing the right thing, Todd? Yes. Just go into PowerPoint. You should be fine. Into okay. presentation. Sorry. Okay. Sure. Oh no, I gotta go back. There we go. Okay. Great. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Now that we've got over the technical difficulties, I'm good. Um, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, some of the legal issues, um, both privacy as well as new interoperability regulations that are designed um, both to protect data and to facilitate um, the sharing of that data. So um, when we think of, when I think about data and data protections and data accessibility, there's sort of this trade-off between having greater accessibility and greater data protections. Um, and there's benefit to both, right? So increased interoperability um, and data access between different stakeholders can really create new opportunities to improve health and healthcare. We can see better care coordination, better um, data analytics to support treatment and um, improvements in treatment and, uh, and better care for individuals. We can see growing patient engagement. Um, and also we're seeing a lot of new innovative technologies leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to provide better decision support tools. All of that is really built on the availability of electronic health information um, that can support those different efforts. But on the other hand, there are significant risks to privacy and security. Um, there's also lack of transparency in how data is being used. Um, and so all of these issues kind of come into play. And there's really sort of this balance between data protection and data access. Both are critical. Um, and we're trying to find that balance. And the balance keeps shifting. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of that shifting balance. So first, let's start by talking about um, health data protections and individual rights. So there's a series of different um, uh, regulations that uh, interplay here to support protections of health data. And there are some very well-established protections. So HIPAA has been around, uh, the HIPAA statute came out in 1996. The initial privacy regulations came out in 2000. Um, and they really focus on um, data protection for health information, um, although with some limitations, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
But there are other laws that come into play when we talk about data privacy and data protections. So there are some more stringent federal laws like the, um, the rules governing substance abuse treatment disorder data, which are the part two regulations that I show here. And those provide for heightened protections of patient data um, in certain circumstances. Um, there's also different rules the Federal Trade Commission focuses on, um, uh, can provide some enforcement of privacy protections for um, applications that may be outside of the HIPAA protected bubble. Um, and then there's a variety of state laws that come into play. Um, lots of states have laws about particular types of data like mental health data or substance abuse data, um, genetic data, HIV data, um, and those kind of lay on top of the additional federal protections. So just quickly on HIPAA because um, I wanna then talk about what's changing. Um, HIPAA does uh, three things. There are three different uh, regulations. There's a privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. Um, but I wanna focus on the privacy rule. The, the privacy rule does two basic things. It sets use, it limits on uses and disclosures of health information, and then it establishes individual rights, such as the individual right of access to their own data. Um, What's really important about the about all of these rules is that they um, they only apply to individually identifiable health information held by certain entities. These are covered entities um, and their business associates, those that are doing work with those covered entities. So it's limited to healthcare providers, health plans, and healthcare clearinghouses, and then other organizations that do work on behalf of those organizations, like billing companies, um, an electronic health record company would be a business associate and the like. It doesn't cover a lot of types of health data, like health data held by um, consumer applications. So if you have a mobile application that you're using to track your symptoms, uh, to track your, um, your exercise, to track your physical therapy, whatever it is, um, the data held in there, while it may be health information, may not be protected by these rules. Um, similarly, de-identified information is not protected by the rules. So to the extent that um, different organizations in doing big data analytics want access to de-identified data, um, that data might be outside of protections as well. And as we all know, de-identified data can often be combined with other data sets um, and, and not remain de-identified, so there's some risk there. Under HIPAA, again, um, we also have, I mentioned the individual's rights, including what I think is the most important individual right, the individual's right to access their own data. And this is gonna come into play when we talk about the data access rules. So under HIPAA, um, individual is guaranteed a right to access their health information, um, but they have 30 days to provide access to that data. And what's happened is, is that even though we've had this right for the last 20 years, um, it is very difficult, and Harlan will probably talk a little more about this, it has historically been very difficult for patients to get access to their own data. There are a lot of hurdles that, um, that different entities have put in place. They've charged fees, even though sometimes those fees may not even not be lawful. Um, they have um, made patients wait, and if you look at 30 days, if somebody's dealing with an acute condition or with a serious condition like a cancer diagnosis, 30 days may be just too long. Um, and so there have been some challenges with really enabling patients to be empowered with their own data. Um, I also just noted here that there have been lots of efforts by the administration, various, both administrations, the Obama administration and now the Trump administration, to support patient access to their own data through the Medicare program, through the Blue Button program. So there have been non-regulatory um, efforts as well to promote patients' access to their own uh, health information. So let's talk a little bit more about data access. So um, there's really, uh, I see this huge shift um, that's happening. So in the, for the past 20 years, we've talked about how do you protect data? And everybody who had health data, all healthcare providers and plans would think about how do I protect the data that I have? Um, and that, you know, focusing on not sharing data unless there's a permitted purpose and unless it's necessary. So now we have a shift in that balance that, that I showed at the beginning where um, there have been lots of different concerns about people not getting access to data that they needed. So I mentioned that patients have routinely had a hard time getting access to their data, even though they have a right. 
Um, we've also seen that even with a growing amount of electronic health records, electronic health information, that the electronic health information sort of remained in silos. So each you know, hospital or health system would have these data silos, but the data wouldn't often flow between them very easily. And the government had invested $34 billion in the adoption of electronic health records with the hope that they would that patients would benefit and that the health systems would benefit from more efficient care at lower cost with better outcomes. Um, and that didn't happen right away because we had these silos of data. Um, the reason for that, or at least one of the things that, and I, I had worked for the Department of Health and Human Services, so I'm speaking from my own experience and what our concerns were, was that data was seen as an asset. And um, there were a lot of um, economic disincentives to sharing that information. So a hospital didn't necessarily want to share information with the hospital down the street because it'd be easier for the patient to switch and go over there rather than going to the hospital where all their health data was. Same thing with electronic health record vendors. We would see electronic health record vendors that were sitting on all of this data and they would charge um, different applications to access the data, even to provide services to a hospital or a health system. Um, they might also make it difficult to share for, with another EHR system because they, you know, if they have uh, all of this EHR data, they might be able to track more customers in order to access that data. So there are lots of economic disincentives to sharing data. And the government decided we need to improve interoperability in order to have better patient care in a learning health system and improve patient access to information. So along came the 21st Century Cures Act, um, which set uh, a legal prohibition on information blocking. Um, this means that uh, the, what Congress stated was that if an entity knows or should know that a particular practice is unreasonable, and likely to interfere with, prevent, or materially discourage access, exchange, or use of electronic health information, um, that is a violation of law, and the penalties can be up to $1 million per violation. So that's pretty big. So now all of a sudden, you came from this paradigm of, if I share information and I get it wrong, I can violate the HIPAA rules. So I'll just, if I'm not sure, I'm not gonna share the data, to an environment where if I don't share the data, now I can be in violation of law with these huge penalties. Um, so we have this huge shift where now folks are trying to figure out, these entities are now trying to figure out how do we make data available so that we're not considered information blockers. Um, these rules, the applicability is different than HIPAA. So it applies to healthcare providers. Both of the rules apply to healthcare providers, HIPAA and info blocking. Um, it also applies directly to health IT developers. So those EHR vendors. Um, who used to be business associates under HIPAA or are business associates under HIPAA, they are now directly responsible, they're direct actors under info blocking. And then health information exchanges and networks, which is a fairly broad term that brings in a lot of entities. Any entity that helps with the sharing of health data um, can be a health information exchange or a network. Um, so it's not just um, the a traditional HIE, it could be a broader set of actors. So this is, I just summarized, what is an, what it, when is an entity inf engaged in information blocking? So you have to be an actor, you have to be one of those four different kinds of entities. Um, it has to be electronic health information, so it's not paper, it's just electronic, which when we talk about big data, we're talking about large sets of electronic information. Um, it has to interfere with access exchange or use. So now if, um, you know, if somebody's trying to get access to that data and somebody says, an actor says no, that can be information blocking. Um, there are exceptions, so, you know, to protect privacy and security, um, and there are, there is a potential that if you have a reasonable and necessary practice, that it could still be determined to be um, permissible, uh, but there's lots of risk if, if you don't fall within one of the exceptions. So what I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on is just this comparison of info blocking and HIPAA. Um, the way I think about information blocking is it really turns HIPAA on its head. All of a sudden, we have a huge huge paradigm shift from, if I'm not sure what to do, I'm gonna not share the data, I'm gonna protect the privacy and security of that data, to if I, don't, um, if I don't share the data, I might be in violation. So now my preference is I should share that data. The way the, the rules actually say, if a disclosure is permitted under HIPAA, not required, but permitted under HIPAA, and there's a lot of permitted disclosures, 
it is now required under information blocking. So if it's permitted under HIPAA, it's required under information blocking. And I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of where this might come up. Um, under HIPAA, there is a violation if you share data when it was not allowed. Under information blocking, there's a violation of not sharing data when it's required. Um, the penalties under the HIPAA rules are lower than the uh, information blocking rules, uh, which are enforced by the Office of Inspector General. Um, with the one caveat that they have not yet said how they're going to enforce against healthcare providers with regard to information blocking. So that's still up in the air. Um, and as I said, HIPAA applies to all, all data, paper and electronic, and, and info blocking is only electronic. So here's some examples. I just want to go through a couple of these. So now, um, a hospital, if a hospital requests medical records from a competing hospital for treatment of a patient, that would become a required disclosure under info blocking. Um, unless there's an exception. So, you know, if there's a risk of harm, if there, if the patient specifically said, I don't want to share that data, if there's a state law that requires consent, there may be lots of reasons for not sharing that data. But in the majority of cases, if a hospital asks for electronic health information from another hospital, failure to provide that or provide that in a timely manner and in a standardized manner could be a violation of information blocking. Um, if a healthcare provider requests that electronic health information be transferred from their current EHR to a new HR, again, that would be a required disclosure. Um, and, and all of this is, you know, there are some exceptions, but these are generally um, uh, uh, the case. Um, if a healthcare provider wants their EHR vendor to provide an interface so that they, to a lab so they can get lab test results, again, they would have to not just provide electronic health information, but provide the mechanism for that data sharing to occur. Um, they could charge for some of their costs for doing that, as long as they're reasonable and related to the cost of providing the service. Um, if, a, if an app developer wants to, uh, needs access to health data that's in an electronic health record in order to provide a clinical decision support software to the health system, the EHR would have to work with that healthcare uh, app to share that data. Um, and here are some of the interesting ones um, that I think can raise some concerns and we can have discussion later, but if a health plan requests access to bulk data from a health information exchange or from a health system for population health management or care coordination purposes, which are all um, healthcare operations under HIPAA, that might be a required disclosure. Uh, if a pharmaceutical company requests access to records for research purposes pursuant to an IRB waiver of authorization, uh, it's a permitted disclosure under HIPAA, and therefore it is likely required under info blocking, again, subject to some exceptions. Um, and lastly, uh, if a mobile application um, pings a provider's patient portal for access to health data on behalf of a patient who signed up for the app, um, the healthcare provider would have to provide that information, even if the app says on their website, we sell this data. As long as the patient authorizes it and directs their provider to send that data, the healthcare provider cannot say, we don't want to share with that app because we don't like what they're doing with the data once they get it. Um, they, it's up to the patient to make that determination. So um, lots of interesting things to talk about later. Um, and uh, I will turn this back over to, uh, to the next speaker. I can't remember who was going next. Um, thanks, Jody. Uh, our next speaker is Glenda Roberts. Um, and I will pause for a second to let uh, Ms. Roberts get her presentation up. Okay, great. Thank you, Todd. Hi, my name is Glenda Roberts. And as Todd said, I'm with the University of Washington with responsibility for patient engagement and external relations. And more importantly, I happen to be a person who is living with kidney disease. So in my first career, I was involved in the information services industry. I worked for companies like General Electric Information Services and Microsoft. And my career evolved from a software developer to a senior business executive. I went from the time where we talked about databases and database management to data analytics and the integration of data so that you have the knowledge worker, which leads us to where we are today. 
And that's the ability for people to make informed decisions using the data that's available. Now, my second career started about three years ago after I had retired and I moved into the kidney health industry where I worked for not only the Kidney Research Institute, where we're looking at research to develop solutions to make life better for people living with kidney disease and the Center for Dialysis Innovation, where we're actually developing products. And my job is to ensure that patients are active participants, not only as research participants, but also actively involved in the research projects themselves. So they become domain experts. And I work on a number of different, in the industry with other partners, I work on a number of different projects that are really exciting and really relevant to some of the things that I'll be focusing on later. One is the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, where we're recognizing that there is no one size that should fit all treatment for people living with kidney disease. As a matter of fact, they're probably not just chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury, but there are probably maybe a hundred different types of kidney disease. And we're working to identify those and develop treatments and therapeutics to make life better for people like me who have kidney disease. Now, moving from a personalized perspective, I'm also involved on the Apollo Project, which is focused on identifying a gene that is associated with kidney disease for people who are, whose ancestry is from Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, I have a personal interest in that because it would have been nice to know if that gene was the cause of my kidney disease. And I'm a member of ASN and the National Kidney Foundation, which are sponsoring the EGR and Race Task Force, which is the reason that I was invited to speak here. I am a patient member of that task force and it is made up of leading physicians in the industry as it relates to kidney disease so that we can develop a unified approach to evaluating the including, inclusion of race in the determining of the effectiveness of your kidneys. Now, COVID-19 is a global problem and it is testing everybody. Whether you're in government, a public health agency, a medical professional, or just a part of the general population, we're all concerned about kidney disease. And data can help us fight this virus if we ask the right questions. It can help us craft approaches to address the spread of the disease and also help us evaluate the effectiveness. For instance, the recommendation that we socially distance and that we use masks is useful, but more importantly, we need to be able to evaluate whether or not these recommendations are working. It can also help us determine how to allocate resources as the disease moves from one state to one community to different subsects of that community, it'll help us make decisions about how we allocate our resources to best serve those areas or people that have the greatest need at any point in time. And it can also help us with the economy to help us to determine when we should reopen our businesses or if there's a need to close again. Now, this should be obvious, but bad data is not good. And that is incorrect or incomplete data can have adverse consequences. It, it can cause us to overlook important nuances within the community and cause us to make faulty judgments. It also potentially exposes people's private information needlessly, and it can be used for nefarious purposes. Ideally, We'd like for that not to happen, but people are creative. And so they will use the data in ways that benefit them that do not necessarily benefit us. So from my standpoint, the big question here is how do we migrate and contain the COVID-19 pandemic while we balance the social and economic cost? I decided that since I had been invited here because of my role on the EGR, EGFR and Race Task Force, I take the top two principles and see if we could apply COVID-19 in that context. So modifying the primary principles, our goals are 
to examine the inclusion of race in the assessment of, in this case, COVID-19 and the implications for the diagnosis and subsequent management of patients with or at risk for COVID-19 related diseases. I had to take a little liberties there. It used to say kidney diseases, but we know increasingly long haulers are people who continue to have symptoms after they have been cured of COVID-19 are important to evaluate. We must also recognize that any COVID-19 reporting, so we're talking about data now, must consider the multiple social and clinical implications, be based on rigorous science, and be part of a national conversation about uniform reporting of COVID-19 across healthcare systems. But I would expand that to say healthcare systems and systems that are using data from those healthcare systems. So again, the big question for us to consider as participants is how do we ensure that the government, public health agencies, medical officials, and private entities are accountable for what they do with our data? We know that they're using it to conduct and analyze new data sources and make determination. Some of them are business decisions that don't necessarily operate in our best interest, but it's our job to make sure that we monitor and control that. Now, if we step back for a moment and we look at the data from the CDC, you'll see that it says here that if you have asthma, you're 1.5 times more likely to have a severe complication for COVID-19. Now, I happen to be a person that falls into a number of these categories. I have hypertension, I am obese, I have chronic kidney disease. So that means that I have three or more of the conditions that are likely to increase having a severe reaction, excuse me. And that is amplified when you consider the fact that race has to be considered as a mitigating factor when looking at any of these conditions. We know that for underrepresented minorities, they tend to have a higher occurrence, not because of their race necessarily, but because of the social determinants of health. Now, just looking at the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, you can see that if you are an Asian American, you tend to align more closely with what happens in the white community. But if you are any of the people of color, whether that's a Native American, an African American, or a Latinx person, the multipliers are significant in terms of the incidence of diseases, the hospitalization, and subsequent death. Now, this was an interesting story that I found as I was thinking about how I wanted to approach this. First, I found the data from the Pew Institute that showed us what the percentage of people in different states who were African-Americans. If you were Black, how much more likely were you to die from COVID-19? And there's this guy named Dr. David Byes, who is a state health official and he is an assistant professor at Mississippi State University. And he was looking at the Mississippi data. And you can see here that if you are an African-American in Mississippi, it represents about 37% of the population, but more than 50% of the deaths that are associated with COVID-19. David's review of the data was reviewing, was finding similar things. He found that the percent of African-Americans who got COVID-19 was greater than whites. The percentage of African-Americans who died from COVID-19 was greater than whites. But among all people considered, whites were more likely to die from COVID-19 if they got it. And this caused him to ask an interesting question. He said there's something about a particular setting or subpopulation that are driving these odd findings. Now, that's interesting. Keep in mind, he looked at it from a setting and a subpopulation perspective. So he started by saying, is it something about where people are living in the state? Is it about the kind of work that they do? Or is it about the kind of places that they're living in? Are we talking about people who are living in nursing homes and long-term healthcare facilities? What's actually driving this data? His 
his data analysis led him to conclude that the change in direction, in other words, more whites dying from if they got COVID-19, was because long-term health care facilities or nursing homes were being overwhelmed by COVID-19 cases. And in Mississippi, as in many states, long-term health care residents are more likely to be white. So this, in this case, the relationship between race and COVID-19 mortality was different between the general community and those who lived in long-term facilities. The key point that I'm really making here is that race is a social construct. It's not a biological construct. We use it as a type of shorthand because it's convenient and it makes it easy for us to talk about issues. And you've seen this chart before. Whenever you look at CDC charts, you will notice that they always say that race and ethnicity are risk markers for underlying conditions that impact health. In other words, the social determinants of health are impacting different racial groups within America in, particu in particular. So the key question here is, what is there about a particular setting or subpopulation that might be addressed to help mitigate and develop, help mitigate the development and spread of COVID-19? Now, of course, there are other questions that could be answered, but from my perspective, this is the key question. People of color are hardest hit by COVID-19 because they have the highest risk of infection because of where they live, work, and how they travel. They tend to be in low-income jobs. They are densely populated in terms of their living situations. Typically, it's multi-generations living in a singular home. The houses tend to be close together. You don't have nice expansive lawns so that people can easily socially distance. And they travel quite often using shared or public transportation, which increases the risk. So higher hospitalization and death rates are affected by higher infection rates, the social de determinants of health and the barriers to healthcare. Now, if we step back and we look at the African-American race, the recently in August of 2020, uh, blackdoctors.com did a survey among African-American participants and they asked, Are, were we likely to take the COVID-19 vaccine? 58% said that they would not take the vaccine as soon as it was available. 22% said they would take the vaccine, but they had concerns. So if you add that together, that's 80% of the African-Americans said they wouldn't take the vaccine or they have concerns. And you have to ask why. And the answer was that we don't trust the healthcare facility. Now that's unfortunate since we tend to be the largest percentage of people that are being affected by COVID-19. But the detrust is not unwarranted. I'm sure you've heard about the syphilis study that started back in the 1930s, where you had this large group of African-American men who were down in Alabama that had syphilis. And they were told by the US Public Health Department that they were going to be evaluated and given treatments for their conditions. They were not told that they had syphilis and they were not given treatments. The government simply allowed the disease to manifest to see what the ultimate outcome would be. The adverse impact was on the larger community because here you had men that had syphilis, that didn't know they had syphilis, that were interfacing with the rest of their community. And so the disease tended to spread throughout the community. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that was a long time ago. Actually, that wasn't a long time ago. While this was supposed to be a six month study, it lasted for over 40 years. The syphilis study continued even after government funding was discontinued and it was not stopped until 1972. I was already out of college by 1972. So it really wasn't that long ago. The other case involved Henrietta Lacks, who was an African American woman who was relatively young, 31 years old when she died. She had cervical cancer. And a guy named Dr. George Gay noticed that her cells continued to reproduce 
even after they had been removed from our body. Usually cells tend to die, as you know, after a period of time, but Henrietta Lacks cells didn't die. And when she died, Dr. Gay had his medical assistant go down to the morgue and harvest additional cells from Henrietta Lacks. Clearly, that's a, a, that was a violation of her privacy and there was no informed consent. And as recently as 2016, we're still seeing biases in the healthcare community against African-Americans. This was a study written by Dr. Jane Sabin, who happens to be from the University of Washington. And it noted that healthcare professionals believe that Black people have, that our nerve endings are less sensitive, that our skin is thicker than white people, and that our blood tends to coagulate quicker. I trust you, that's not the case, but that is a perception. And that is reflected to a large extent in the way healthcare professionals interface with ethnic minority populations, not just black people, but all ethnic minority populations. A study that was done in 2010 and later validated in 2016 was that doctors tend to give ethnic minorities less information about their disease, tend to be less empathetic and pay less attention. Now, we all understand that everybody is busy, but I'm telling you, when the analysis was done, looking at a white person interfacing with their physician and an ethnic minority interfacing with their physician with the same condition, the amount of time that was dedicated to understanding that patient and the patient's need was significantly less. Now that has a significant implication for COVID-19 because as we're trying to get more and more people to get vaccinated so that we can slow the spread of the disease and hopefully eventually snuff it out, people have to have confidence in the healthcare systems. Now there is a glimmer of hope. Among the 42% of African-Americans, so the 20% who said, yes, I'll take the disease and the 22% who said, yes, uh, who said I'll take the vaccine and the 22% who said, I'll take it, but I have concerns. Almost 50% of those said that they would take the vaccine. And the main reason was because COVID is not going away. So it indicates that there's considerable, considerable concern about the pandemic and their personal health. When they dug deeper into the data, they found that there were a number of reasons that people gave for making the decision to take the vaccine. I would argue that as healthcare professionals, this creates an opportunity for you when you are interfacing with patients and you're trying to get them to take the vaccine or to take other treatments. Look at the reasons that people are making the decisions. They say that I work in a job where there's lots of contact with crowds. Well, get to know what your patients are doing. Like my nephrologist always talks to me about the work that I'm doing with the Kidney Research Institute. And when she wants to know if I'm exercising enough, she'll say, oh, are you still involved with teen transplant? In the first 10 years after I got my transplant, I completed nine half marathons. So that told her about the level of my exercise. Well, not everybody's doing half marathons, but you can say to a person, well, do you have a dog? Do you walk the dog? That gives you an indication again about that person and how they're exercising. But more importantly, it conveys that you have an interest or concern in that individual, which makes them more likely to open up to you. So when you ask the patient how they're doing, they won't just say, I'm fine, because obviously they probably wouldn't be there if they were fine. When you look at big data, I can't emphasize enough the importance of asking the right question. Will we be able to use big data to end or reinforce social inequities that are associated with the social constructs around race? So we need to make a conscious decision about what impact does this data or the use of this data have on our various communities? Do we understand the algorithms or the standards that the various entities are using? For instance, because I grew up primarily in a corporate environment, 
I understand that our formulas would have been proprietary. We would not have been providing that information to anyone. And hopefully governments will start to get corporations to be more open, especially in the context of COVID-19, so that people have greater trust. And as we start to integrate data from different data sources, not just across healthcare systems, but as you start to take private information from my Fitbit or from my phone or from other applications, and you integrate it with the health information, trust me, private entities will use that information to create new products that don't necessarily benefit us as a community. And it's our job to ask questions about how they're doing that and what those algorithms are. And specifically in the context of COVID-19, if we're going to mitigate the current disease and our current approaches aren't working, then we need to ask the question, should we support technology innovation or something else? Now in Taiwan, and actually in a number of countries, in Russia, Poland, Taiwan, and China, they do a lot of technology surveillance. The US is not so inclined to accept that from a healthcare standpoint, but if you think about it, we're surveilled all the time. Every time you go to an ATM machine, they take a picture of you. Even if you're just walking down the street, the ATM machine takes a picture of you. So it's possible to track our movements. But we have to make people comfortable that if we use these kinds of technologies, we're not going to be taking advantage of their personal privacy. And I want to read this quote because it really illustrates the fact that this is a global issue. Now, this is a quote from Mark Gannon, who is the Director of Business Change Information Solutions in Sheffield, England, okay? He said, we wanna give the organization and the city the greatest opportunity to bounce back from COVID. Part of that focus is around using digital and data. People tend to not trust government with their data. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time upfront on the public trust element. The aim is to do everything in the open. So we publish all of our plans, working out algorithms, everything we use. We'll make it so people can see what we're doing. And that is so important that people be able to see what we're doing and have confidence. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that new uses of people's data potentially involves both personal and social harms. However, in the context of COVID-19, failing to leverage the enormous power of data to halt or slow the pandemic also involves personal and social harm. So I think our key takeaway is that we must mitigate and contain the COVID-19 pandemic while we balance the social and economic costs. And the question is, what do we need to do to make that happen? I'd like to thank and acknowledge those people that helped make it possible for me to share my perspective with you today, in particular, the American Society of Nephrology and the Kidney and the National Kidney Foundation, the Kidney Research Institute and the Center for Dialysis Innovation, who are led by Dr. Buddy Ratners and Jonathan Himmelfarb. And in particular, I'd like to thank the CMSS President Todd Ibrahim for inviting me to share my perspective today. Thank you. Thank you, Glenda. Um, Harlan, I will uh, turn it over to you in the library. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, so appreciate the opportunity to be part of this terrific panel and to hear the great talks that preceded me. And I'll, I'll do my best to, to uh, both present something cogently, but to get through it, to give us a little bit of time for questions at the end. Uh, you know, my talk is entitled Real World Participant Centric Evidence Generation. And it's really forward thinking. I was asked to present some information about a, a, a project, a company that I co-founded uh, and approach what I want to do is talk about ideas, really. And uh, so I just want to disclose this, and I'm a co-founder of, of Hugo Health, and I, I think you'll see how this all connects. So the question of this group was, how do we balance power of big data with responsibility 
and accountability by researchers and others. How do we balance power of big data with responsibility and accountability? And, and I, I want to reframe that question just a little bit, take a little bit of the prerogative and, and just uh, linger for a second on the research world that I was raised in and, and the world that I want to live in. Um, you know, it, it, the world that I was raised in, what I mean is raised as a, an investigator, as a, I'm a cardiologist, I'm a clinician uh, and a clinical scientist, but really people were, were, were subjects and researchers were, were all knowing. And, and, you know, we saw data anywhere we could get it almost without regard to it, uh, as Glenda has sort of alluded to. We did it for, for great purposes. We sought to make things better, but we, we were sort of a, um, full of ourselves a little bit in the way that we approach things. We didn't return results often. We would enroll people in studies and not even tell them what we found. Uh, we really weren't, weren't listening intently to the people who were entering our studies. Like I said, they were subjects. We would catch them. We would get them in our studies. If they escaped, we go out and bring, try to bring them back. And, you know, it was really only later that I, I began to think differently about this scientific enterprise and the way in which we need to proceed and the obligation that we have to honor and respect those people who are participating with us, to, to listen to their problems, to include them avidly as partners and as part of the team. And, and it began with, uh, I led the Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at Yale. And, and in a renewal that occurred in 2005, we were we were mandated to incorporate community-based participatory research into the curriculum. And, and you know, that, that was, those were strange words to me then. I, I wasn't really familiar with it. And it began a journey for me and, and my colleagues to really get out into the community, to listen, to do the kind of things that Glenda's talking about, to, to become more sensitive to the issues that the people are facing that we're seeking to help, and to enlist us together as a team to try to build out uh, research. So there's more reasons to do this than just because it's right, by the way. I mean, I, my premise is that, our, and I've written this multiple times, uh, that our current research enterprise is too slow, too expensive, and too labor intensive to meet the needs, needs of patients in society. And, and it too often neglects the rights, preferences, and values of people. And so it's not functioning at a particularly high level and with regard to the positioning it has versus vis-a-vis the public and society, we're not necessarily in the strongest uh, position. And so uh, the reframing question here to me is, how do we align with people in ways that build trust, respect their rights, enlist them in research and return value to them so that we're really all working together as one team? We're, we're, we're aligned in our purpose and we're producing at a level that we've never achieved before. Now, Part of this is just because it's a good idea if we're trying to understand healthcare system, its performance, and be able to integrate meaningful outcomes into our studies and be able to do that at a rapid speed. The information we need is often not conveniently in claims data or even in medical records data, a single institution. And as you know, many efforts to try to get these data, claims data is often can be a year out of date. The CMS data that comes out and I'm involved in developing these measures. I mean, it can be like a year or two out of date by the time it comes up. It's not relevant to everyday practice. And extracting information from the medical records in the way that we have traditionally done it with labor intensive human abstraction, it tends to also put in delays and to force us to be narrow in what we collect. So ultimately we're not able to get the granularity of information we need. We need information across institutions and from people's experiences and social circumstances. And the only way we're gonna be able to do this, and by the way, in the absence of a national medical identifier, we need to work with people so that they can connect to where their data are, have that data come in, organized and have them be able to have the opportunity to share it in the study if we are worthy of them and we need to become worthy of them. We need comprehensive integrated data to promote discovery and improve and personalize care and illuminate and eliminate disparities. The richness of the information we need, the granularity of it, that it, it, it mandates our necessity to work with people in ways that are constructive and aligned. But, but without this kind of information, we're not gonna be able to develop the kind of interventions and be able to test ourselves for accountability and, and understand what we're achieving. We need strategies, I believe then, that empower people as partners, leverage the digital data, promote trust, ensure privacy and security and create opportunities to uh, bring that data together and harmonize it in ways that will have great power. And I wanna just uh, focus on this promote trust idea. 
because the the issue is is that if we continue to work behind people's back, if data continues to circulate, if as Glenda said that we're, people aren't sure what's happening with their data and and whether it's in their best interest, we will continue to diminish the trust between science and the public, and we will diminish our opportunity to work together as partners. People won't listen to us. We we will continue to go down this path that will undermine the, the possibilities and potential that we have within science to actually make people's lives better and healthier. Now, as, as Jody said eloquently, and, and I really posting these slides be very important. That, that was a chock full of information talk that has really essential information for people to know in this era. These new laws reinforce the ability of people to bring together health information about themselves and to make decisions uh, about it uh, in ways that, that have been kind of anchored in the law, but not really promoted in the way that these new rules and regs uh, enable. And they're gonna make a new era possible. Now this era could be beneficial or harmful, honestly. And so it's gonna be up to us to weigh in and ensure that this is all in the best interest of people and strengthens their position in research and clinical care. This is the era. We are not gonna go back to an era where we just don't tell people stuff. It just doesn't work. It's not gonna work like that. It's going to work where data is going to be moving more freely. People are going to have more choices and options. And we're going to have to make sure that it's, it's aligned in their best interest and there are safeguards and guardrails. My, my vision about this is people, when we're talking about on the research and knowledge generation side, it's people as partners in research uh, and people and their data fueling the research engine. People being respected and rewarded for their research contributions, which includes making sure that they know the results of what we've done. Now, just to show you an example of this effort that I've been working on, as I was working in PCORI, as I was working in various areas, and we were talking about these kind of ideas at the NIH and other places with, with professional sites, with the American College of Cardiology, what was obvious to me was that there was a lack of a platform, a medium to be able to provide this that would adhere strictly to the idea that, mon that it was not going to monetize data behind people's backs or in any way move data without people's permission but was gonna strengthen people's permission to become partners in prospective data collection and, and be able to provide the real world data that I believe is necessary to get to the granularity uh, that will enable us to do the kind of work that's necessary. So created this thing, Hugo Health, uh, which was really a patient-centered real world data collection and sharing it. And I'm here to share you the ideas and example of this. I'm not here to, to promote or sell, but rather to, to, to get you thinking broadly about something like this. And so this was a turnkey research solution that is intended for participant as partner studies. And by the way, Glenn, we're, we're doing a CDC-based study at the University of Washington on long haulers that I got to pull you into that uh, I, I'm not sure that, that you're aware of, but, but this is a way to say that how do we engage people? And, and just to, I don't know if I have time to go through this, but just to give you the sense is that the, 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 the story was that it, we set out to drive clinical research and healthcare towards a more patient-centered paradigm that created greater effectiveness and efficiency through better use of people's data. And the problem to be solved was that there were inefficiencies and underperformance in clinical research and healthcare delivery because of inadequacies in information flow. And the right data is not available at the right place at the right time. And often when it, it, it is, it's in an inter inoperable format, undermining the potential. And we envisioned value in a platform that would provide people agency over their healthcare data, integrate data from disparate health sources, different EMRs, wearables, sensors, remote monitoring, surveys, and, and, and be able to create an engine that overcame the interoperability issues and then fuel better science and discovery. And the mission was going to be to transform healthcare by connecting people and their data, helping people embrace their potential of, of the health information for themselves or families in society through participation research that could speed discovery. And that this could ultimately have applications within when patients, people with their data seeking second opinions, people with their data having now comprehensive longitudinal data about themselves, not fragmented information, being able to dock into places where then they're receiving their care. And the, the sort of simplified model of this is that the participant on the far left is able through their credentials and now with the power of the, the new regs to be able to connect to where their data lies, whether it's health systems, pharmacies, payers, wearables, and could produce surveys in through uh, APIs, these, uh, uh, these application program interfaces, connect and then on, an, on a virtually everyday uh, 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 frequency, like Jody was saying is now permitted in law, we could go collect that data, bring it in, 
harmonize it and have it as their data asset. And then with their permission, and this is the, the, the middle part, this harmonizing engine, then with their permission, it, either they could see it and view it, or it can be sent wherever they want to send it to, to clinicians, to researchers. And all of that is updated in almost real time. So it's not a matter of waiting, going requesting data. It, it's coming in and it's being mediated through the individual. So it's B to C to B from the data source to the person who then with permissioning allows it to go where they want it to go. And, you know, so we're able to connect to 3,500 healthcare systems to all the pharmacies. We're now connecting to payers because of the regs, device systems, and, and be able to put out any kind of patient survey we want. All that data goes back to the person. And then the permissioning is then it goes to where they want to send it. But the person is always retaining a copy of all their data in a secure cloud-based account that they can access or provide sharing to. And, you know, an important part about this is that data is not a commodity. It's not just about the connections, but it's about providing the true interoperability at the various levels so that you can be confident. They can be confident and whoever's working with them can be confident that the data is high quality. I'm a researcher. This data quality issue was really important to me. And it blew my mind about all the ways in which the data that you can get electronically can be corrupted or mislabeled or miscoded or misclassified, even with fire endpoints. So there's a lot of work fire can transmit, but you've got to make sure that the underlying coding and mapping is proper. And this is all things that, that, that are necessary, no matter who's doing it. So, you know, we, we sort of put this together so that, you know, we're, and we've done studies, by the way, in low health literacy groups and in a variety of groups, because we don't want this to build a digital divide. But th this seems to be something that people embrace, especially the idea that now they've got access to the data. Something, as Jody said, even though the law said it was permitted and, and actually available before, wasn't really uh, in, in the current, wasn't, there were no mechanisms to do it easily. And people were often uh, um, being sent down wrong paths for it. Um, this is also for people who are then tracking studies or working within uh, the context of these. There's you know, ways to do this. But the, the idea behind this was create the mechanism by which we could effectuate the power of the regs and include people as true partners in the effort. We, we've already been out uh, and working with lots of different collaborators now on this. It, I would say we're still at an early phase in the sense that it, it hasn't gotten the ubiquity, but I believe that this is gonna be the way of the future, whether it's this platform or others. And, and we're already working with people. And like I said, uh, Glenda, you know, you dub, we're working uh, on a CDC project together on long haulers and uh, just about to launch. Got FDA studies in the field. There, there are lots of things because, and all these people are committed to this idea. So, so what could the future look like? Well, you know, my question is, could this be the next generation registries? Well, you know, we'll still can need to look at retrospectively, but we need to be able to engage people prospectively with alignment of patients with rich information about their care and outcomes. Are these, is this the next generation real world registries? Is this uh, kind of the kind of real world, real time data with people's participation that feeds directly into a knowledge generation pipeline for discovery, accountability, and improvement so that this becomes a steady stream with people's permission that helps us to learn rapidly, both for clinical care and for discovery? Can these participant centric platforms like Hugo improve trial recruitment, retention, and outcomes ascertainment so that this becomes large numbers of communities? tied together because they're facing similar health challenges, exchanging information and learning together and a readiness cohort to go straight into trials with data flowing. And then with their permission, being able to then say it can go into trials to help to identify the outcomes. The vision again, communities of people empowered by their data, partnering in knowledge generation and producing a, a healthier future. I, I think we're gonna see more and, and more of this the Grave Medical Society has also became very interested in this and saw this as one of the types of areas that they are going to engage in. Thank you. Thank you, Harlan. Um, as, I'm, as Glenda and Jody are, are rejoining and um, we uh, want to encourage the participants to um, put questions in the, in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, as they're um, lining up, I'll, I'll ask you all the same question. And Harlan, I'll start with you just because you had mentioned um, the relationship with the American College of Cardiology, which of course is a CMSS member. I'm just wondering if you could describe in general terms what that relationship looks like. Then I'll ask you and Jody and Glenda to talk a little bit about what you see as the potential role for medical specialty societies in this arena. 
Yeah, so I, I think, you, you know, as ACC, I'm really proud of the ACC. CC and, and, and what it's done in, in its leadership and registries and, and actually all the medical uh, uh, professional groups have, have been pioneers in these areas. But uh, at ACC, we've, we're spending a lot of time talking about, so there is a legacy approach that has been embedded, but it, it, it requires a big investment by hospitals. And, and, and there, by the way, there is an outpatient one that's more digitally enabled, but there's an interest and an appetite, I think, in whether or not a next generation might involve patients uh, in, a, in a more partnered way like this. And we've, so we've done a pilot project with ACC where we sort of have done a bit of like, so, you, you know, within ACC, we have a lot of uh, procedure-based uh, ones. So there's a cath PCI one. And so in the cath lab, we were enrolling people coming through the cath lab onto the platform and then having data stream in, you know, at, in a follow-up so that not only were we getting what happened in the hospital, but then we could figure out what were the what was recovery like? What was how did people recover the function? What kind of symptoms did they have? I mean, it gave us sort of a more refined view of what the experience was like for these individuals. And I would say we're continuing conversations about what kind of opportunities there might be to continue to expand in this kind of uh, approach. That I think in the short run will complement existing legacy types of endeavors, but you know, I think all the professional groups need to start looking and saying, what's this gonna look like in five years? Because it's unlikely to be maintained in the same kind of approach that we've had for the past 15. So, you know, I think that they're eager and avid and they've got a big innovation arm, John Rumsfeld's been to running this now, he, he's uh, elevated within the organization, is thinking hard about how they're planning for the future. And part of that planning is how can we partner more avidly with the with the patients in new and in, in ways that are digitally enabled. Um, before I move to Jerry, just a really quick follow-up question, and it's it's a yes no. Do you think cardiology it's easier to navigate these issues in cardiology because of all the different subspecialties, or do you think that's not a concern or an issue? I, I think this has widespread application because the kind of needs of the patients in cardiology same as it needs everywhere. In fact, I I, I think yeah no I I don't think it's unique to that. So Jody, I, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, thank you for the question. I, I think there's a real opportunity for uh, medical specialty societies, one, to help educate um, their members about the these changing regulations and how there's sort of this growing drive for uh, more access to information to help support patients, patient care and research, um, including for big data. Um, and, and also to set some, um, some best practices for how to do that in a way that both that balances this, the, the, what I was showing before, the need to protect the data as well as to make it available for important purposes. It, it's a really, you know, one of the things we've been working with a lot of, a lot of different organizations on is how do you, like these rules seem to almost contradict each other, at least in, in principle. And, and folks are having a really hard time walking the line between protecting the data of their patients and making sure they're respecting the confidentiality of their patients and helping to make data available both at the patient's direction, like Harlan's talking about, and also to support um, public health purposes, research, et cetera. And I think that specialty societies can really do a great service by helping folks to, by developing some best practices and helping um, members to think through those difficult issues in order to make sure that data can be available um, in ways that it's intended where it can do the best good. Thank you. And Glenda, from your perspective, what, what do you see as a potential role for medical specialty societies in this arena? Well, Todd, you know, and everyone else knows that there is a tsunami of data about COVID-19 and that information is changing rapidly and it's difficult for individuals, whether you are a practitioner or a patient, to keep up to date. So I think that medical societies can be a great trusted source of information, a place that your members can go to get better insight and guidance about what the most current thinking is. But I think another role that you can play is one of advocate, advocate with the, at the federal and state government level to make sure that the rules that are implemented are in the best interest of the patient and of the community. All right, thank you. We have a question from Marty Liggett, who's the executive director of the American Society of Hematology. Um, just to warn Jody, she's also an attorney. Um, so uh, her question, maybe I'll start with you, Jody, and we'll go around the group is, 
Uh, could you elaborate on how much you think the new interoperability requirements will or will not change registries? Thank you for that. And thank you for the warning to let me know that I'm talking to another lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> it's always helpful. Yeah. Um, so I think it can actually, I think it can change registries by making it easier to get access to high quality data and standardized format. Um, one of the, so, um, you know, we have to think more about particular scenarios, but um, like I said, um, the, the rules are really designed to try to facilitate the availability and access to data for important purposes. Um, registries are permissible, it is permissible to disclose information to regist registries, which means that under these rules, there is, there, it, it is very possible that registries can um, use these rules to get access to more information, um, as well as to, th there's a real push in the rules to having information available in standardized format. Um, and, and so again, I, I don't know how every registry is working, but to the extent that that data is coming in in different ways or different quality, or th there may be some growing standardization for that data to be accessed, as well as um, additional um, interfaces and standardized interfaces and APIs that enable the sharing of that data. So, uh, you know, uh, I'd have to think more specifically about how, you know, more, more concrete how it might help, but I do think that it can be um, a helpful tool and that folks, that societies that have registries should look at the regulations to think about wh where they're having roadblocks today, what concerns you have, and how these rules might help facilitate the conversations with organizations for sharing the registry data, and then also for um, getting it in a standardized format. I'll just weigh in quickly here. One is, by, by the way, I want to say that I think one of the great strengths of this group is, is that you do have trust. Like people trust the, the societies. They, they believe that the societies are in it to help, help them, help patients. Uh, I, I believe that. And uh, I know that, you know, ACC and, and, and the public health organizations that work with us, like AHA or a, a, a others, you know, that, that there is a great alignment there and that that trust can be used to help build Communities. I think on this issue about the law, I mean, the law enables things like I described, right, where you're really partnering with patients and communities. But I think that the society should also be thinking forward to a world where um, how, how are they going to manage the electronic data and be able to distill knowledge from it. So increasingly what you're going to see are ECQMs, these electronic clinical uh, uh, data quality measures, and, and obviate the need for human abstraction from the data, but to be able to get pipelines of data that will be then able to be analyzed and organized and in real time fed back. The real promise of the learning healthcare system is that data that's being produced in the everyday operation of the healthcare system can end in people's lives, can then come into common data lakes and be analyzed and organized in ways that and fed back to feed discovery and accountability and improvement together. And, uh, and part of what I'm advocating is that we, we do that in partnership with our patients that we get that we're inclusive and and, and wide-eyed around how we can make that happen. But but I think it's not so much in my view. The law on the registry part is is just uh, showing that we are on an inexorable drive towards a different era, a digital era. And the question is how will the the registries catch up to that era with more partnership with people and also just traditionally as they get pipelines of data from the institutions, how are they going to obviate the need for the usual kind of labor-intensive, slow, expensive approaches? You know, as a data processor, the interoperability question is one that I'm probably biased towards. But as a patient and a person who works in the healthcare area, what I find is that many of the members of these societies aren't sufficiently comfortable using the technologies. They tend to be risk averse. And so I worry that they may not be able or prepared. So it's on the societies to make sure that you address this. They may not be willing, able, or prepared to effectively use the data to its best end. So I'm going to give Glenda the last word. Um, and we've worked together for a long time, so I know that's the right thing to do. Um, but I want to thank her. I want to thank Jody, and I want to thank Harlan for just outstanding presentations. Um, I wish we had more time for the discussion. Um, thank the audience, um, and look forward to. There are a couple requests for slides and for. The recording so we look forward to pulling that all together but just to thank you very much thank you thank you bye-bye